Good morning. I'm Brandon Smith, pastor of Trinity Reformed Baptist Church, and here in Jackson, Georgia, one of uh, your elders. And I'll be uh, giving a Bible study this morning, teaching a Bible study out of Romans chapter 12, finishing up that chapter as we're moving toward some understanding of Romans 13. And so I hope that this will be helpful to you this morning. I want to begin by uh, reading Scripture, and we're going to look at Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will, will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, for this morning, the time of Bible study, teaching, and ask your mercy upon the teacher, and ask your mercy upon the hearers. By the power of your Spirit, you would illumine the truth of your Word to our souls. Lord, I ask your mercy upon us that these verses are somewhat difficult because of remaining flesh for the believer, and ask that you would deal with us according to these truths in right manner, by the power of your Spirit, in dealing with the very words that you have given through the Apostle Paul. May we think rightly about these things as we hear them, and may your Spirit continue to deal with our souls, even after these things are heard, that we would seek to live Christ-like lives before men. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning as we close out uh, Romans chapter 12, I will begin to show us some connections into Romans chapter 13. And so this is really our goal is to head into Romans 13, but we first want to do that by considering the previous portions of the letter. And we've done that with this huge overview of Romans 1 through 11, and then we drew the microscope in and started to look at Romans chapter 12. And now uh, here we are closing out Romans chapter 12, Lord willing, this morning so that we move into Romans chapter 13. Now, notice here in verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. That really is, is, is a theme here of this section in particular of Romans chapter 12. And as we go along, you'll see that theme overlap in some of the language that Paul uses. So keep this idea in mind. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We can imagine how difficult that is to think about uh, blessing people versus cursing them. But as we think about that, there's really some context to that that we want to give, not only for this verse 14, but it gives us some context for the whole of this section and really kind of a whole of chapter 12 as we've looked at it. Firstly, be one who continues to bless people and not curse them. Be one who continues to bless people and not curse them. Now, notice first and foremost, this is an imperative. And really, most of what we will work through in the rest of this chapter and what we've seen in chapter 12 is under the context of an imperative or a command. Now, the idea of imperative and command, this is something that is very important here that we need to recognize. Paul is not giving us suggestions. 
The things I say this morning, I'm going to try to be careful to say them from the text because Paul here is giving us commands. I don't want to give you commands that are not from Scripture. I want you to notice what's being said here in the proper context because these are not suggestions. This is not something that you should take back and say, well, that sounds good and probably is helpful some of the time, uh, but in, a, you know, in certain situations, uh, we just need some, uh, you know, some room to work this out in our own minds. Well, Paul's not giving us that room. This is an imperative, and so is the ideas that come from this imperative. It's an imperative to rejoice with those who rejoice. It's an imperative to never pay back evil for evil to anyone. It's an imperative to never take your own revenge. <clears throat> Paul here is trying to get us to understand that these are commands and he's building off of the commands of the whole of Scripture because much of this comes from Paul's understand, new covenant understanding of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And he's building upon that. So these, these things are commands to us. And the first of these commands is to be one who continues to bless people. Now the word bless is... Um, that, that's a word which sometimes in Christian language we often just throw around. Um, and we'll use that word blessing or blessed be or, you know, bless that person. Um, and the idea here of blessing is something we need to define because oftentimes we don't really think about it. Uh, in, in its context, we just think about it in Christian vernacular that's been thrown around for years and we've heard it. But the, the, the original word here uh, is based off of a word of logos. Logos is word eulageo, and this word means to speak well of. Speak well of. So when Paul says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, he's saying to speak well of them versus to speak ill of them. And I think if we start to really focus in on this imperative and command, we can realize that this is difficult to think through. We're very quick sometimes to speak words that are ill towards individuals. In our present situation, there's a lot of political uh, you know, situations taking place. Even before coronavirus or COVID-19, even before that came on the scene, there's all this political, uh, the political issues of our day going on around us. And there's particular individuals probably sometime we want to quickly speak ill of them because we're tired of hearing them. We're tired of what they're saying. We're, we're finished with them or whatever it may be. And it's a lot easier to speak ill of them than it is to speak a blessing or to speak well of them. This happens in everyday life. You may work with someone. It's a lot easier to speak ill of them. You may deal with a, a particular situation at work or in life. It's just a lot easier to speak ill of them. Uh, whether that's you know speaking ill of somebody in, in the grocery store parking lot or whatever it may be. Notice what Paul is saying here. Speak well of instead of speaking ill of. And that's a command. Now, what's interesting here, twofold, number one is the word itself in the original gives us the idea that this is continual. It's ongoing. This is a practice on our behalf. By the Spirit of God, walking in the Spirit, Romans 8, Paul's explained those types of things to us. We're asking the Spirit of God, deal with us in such a way that we are going to walk in these things. Galatians 5 and 6 in the context of the fruit of the Spirit. Here this is to be continual. It's ongoing. You can't just stand around and say, oh, well, I blessed that person and, and didn't curse that person uh, and I didn't curse them today. Well, it's ongoing work. This is the idea of, of sanctification. It's continual. It's ongoing work. And not only is it ongoing, 
but it's interesting that it's toward our persecutors. These blessings are, are peculiar or particular toward our persecutors. It's one thing to be able to bless someone who's kind of indifferent or, you know, they're kind of easy to work with, to speak well of them. But it's another thing to bless or speak well of a persecutor. Remember, I'm not talking here about suggestions. This, Paul says, is a commandment. Now, what are two ways we do this in the context of the Scripture? Well, number one, make your speech a blessing to them. If you have a persecutor, if you have someone who's a persecutor at the moment, maybe they're not a persecutor all the time, but they're a persecutor at the moment. They're coming against you in, in, in the ways of, of the world. They're coming against you. Well, make your speech a blessing to them. Later on, we'll talk about heaping coals on their head. Make your speech a blessing to them. Don't be one who's always a part of the problem. Number two, make your prayers specifically a blessing for them. Go before the Lord on their behalf. Asking the Lord's mercy upon them. The Lord Jesus put it this way in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The Lord Jesus tells us to pray for those who persecute us. This goes along with Paul's idea here. It's very plain. We are to bless them and not curse them. One writer says when Paul adds bless and curse not, he underlines the fact that our attitude is not to be a mixture of blessing and cursing, but one of unadulterated blessing. That's pretty strong language. He's saying, don't be lukewarm warm on it. Don't be wishy-washy on it. But you need to have an attitude of unadulterated blessing. I have to admit to you, to read this language and think through it, it's difficult. Even for me as a, uh, not only a professing Christian, but one who's been called into the ministry, this is difficult. John Murray goes on and says that nothing less than the pattern of God's own loving kindness and beneficence is the norm for us. He gives us something very important. And Paul is, is giving us an identification of this as he rides through this. This is all an outpouring of God's beneficence to us. If you remember all that God did in saving us, Romans 1 through 11. Think of all that God has done to save us. His loving kindness towards sinners. Well, if God had... The, Paul's been very clear. As a sinner, what have I done to God? I've cursed God. I've sinned against Him. I've been outward in outward rebellion toward Him. I've been in inward rebellion toward Him. And if it were not for His grace, I would be condemned. If I'm humbled by the grace of God toward me as a sinner, I ought to be humbled in my identification of showing that grace to those who are around me, even those who persecute me. Even those who persecute me. Sometimes it's easy to show God's grace to those who are kind or friendly or they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes that can be even difficult. But it can be even harder when we're dealing with people who are in the world. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the very basis of Paul's understanding of these things being worked out from Jesus' understanding, uh, excuse me, from Jesus' teaching on the law. So be one who continues to bless people and does not curse them. Secondly, be benevolent in attitude toward other people. 
Paul goes on and says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's specifics in our idea of benevolence. This particularly here is not benevolence in the sense of giving someone food or drink. That comes later. But here, this is in a benevolent attitude. Rejoice with others. You need to rejoice with your brothers and sisters in Christ. When they have something to rejoice about, rejoice. But you even can rejoice with those who are in the world who may even persecute you. Maybe you work or, or, or you have to go to work with people who persecute you. You can still rejoice with things that happen in their life. When they rejoice, rejoice with them. Maybe there's uh, a man at work who's always got a bad attitude, treats you poorly, but his wife gives birth to a new baby. And he's rejoicing over that baby. You can rejoice with the birth of that child. This rejoicing is an idea of, of an uplifting in, uh, in praise or an uplifting of giving thanks. Now, he may not have an idea of how to give thanks properly to God, but you can rejoice with him with a proper attitude of giving thanks to God for this child being born, if that's the case. Whatever it may be. Uh, a child... Uh, comes back home from service in the military and being, uh, you know, uh, in Afghanistan or something of that nature, and, and, and the parent rejoices, whoever it may be. Rejoice with them. Something good that happens in their life, rejoice with them. And also weep with others. Sometimes difficulties happen. We need to weep with others. We need to be thoughtful of their concerns and their troubles. One writer says, you should not have a cool detachment from other people's joys and sorrows, but fully share in them. Take them on your heart as if they are your own. After all, we are members of one another. In one sense, rejoice with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Weep with them when necessary because we're members of the same body. We are in Christ. You can even weep and rejoice with those who are not in the body of Christ over certain things, not everything, of course. They, they might be rejoicing in things that are sinful, and we certainly don't want to do that. But where there is, that can be done, we're, we're part of a fellow humanity with them, and we can be thankful and rejoice, or we can be saddened. Maybe a parent passes away of, of a neighbor who's an unbeliever and they've been somewhat cantankerous. But their loved one died and you can weep with them. You can show your sorrow. Paul says this is the type of attitude we ought to have. Then he moves forward. He says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now, I'm not going to belabor this much this morning because I spent a lot of time on that last week and I even incorporated verse 16 in some of my comments last week. But I will remind you that we are to be uh, sober thinkers regarding ourselves. Be sober thinkers regarding ourselves or yourself. Soberly think about yourself as a sinner saved by God's grace as you interact with one another. This idea of blessing goes along with the context of us being sinners saved by God's grace. This, this is a statement that ought to stick with us at all times. There's a context in which we need to understand the fullness of what Paul is teaching. He's giving us the sense of blessing, speaking well of one another, working with one another in this sense of grace. Well, I need to be a sober thinker that I've been given grace too. As I interact with other people. I just found out... Uh, you know, this week, we've got some young people that have decided to make donuts in the church parking lot. They're coming up here at odd hours of the night and doing so. Well, you know, if, 
we catch them up here, what do we do? Scream and yell and throw bricks at them and uh, go beat the snot out of them and tear them up and everything else? Well, certainly they need to act better and there probably needs to be something done about it if it can be. On the other hand, there needs to be a reminder. Some of us, when we were younger, did dumb things too. We need to be sober thinkers about ourselves. Soberly think about not regarding yourself more highly in wisdom as you interact with another person. So, as we interact with others, remember the grace of God in our own lives. Also, remember that we're not the only one that has a brain. You know, that, that can be difficult at times. We have to have wisdom, but all wisdom is not our own personal wisdom. I'm not the only one who thinks right. And just because there's other people that think like you do doesn't mean that's right either. We have to be estimated in our understanding of God's grace and God's gift of wisdom to His people to recognize we're not always going to agree, so let's not always hold ourselves in a higher estimation than we ought to. Well, I'll move on from that because, like I said, I made comments last week. Paul comes back to something here, though, that is, is very difficult. <laughs> he says, be at peace with all men as best as possible. Be at peace with all men. Be sober thinkers of ourselves. Be at peace with all men. When we think about what Paul is saying here, to be at peace with all men, that can be really difficult. It's not in the kind of the, the nature of things for those who are desiring to follow Christ and those who are desiring not to follow Christ to be at peace with one another. And there are times where we do have to take stands as Christians and we're not at peace with the world. When it comes to the, the, the serious matters of the gospel, we can't be at peace with the world. We can't give in and say, well, there's many ways to God. Things of that nature. That's certainly true. But just because there are places that we can't give in, that we must stand our ground, and those places are plenty, that doesn't mean that we have to be in constant turmoil with our persecutors or with the world at all times. Matter of fact, what Paul is saying here is constant turmoil is to be consistently avoided. Constant turmoil is to be consistently avoided. To be at peace means that you are seeking that peace and it's something that you are working toward and trying to live in. So constant turmoil is to be consistently avoided. One writer put it this way, he says, to pursue peace then is to fly from misery. There are some things I can compromise on. Not, not doctrinal truth with Christians. Uh, you know, excuse me, not doctrinal truth with, with unbelievers. I can't compromise that. There are certain areas, though, that I may have a debate with an unbeliever about some subject or some issue that I can just walk away from it. I can fly from the misery. They're not going to listen. They're not going to hear me. I can fly from the misery. I've already spoken those things in conversation. They asked a question maybe. I gave them an answer. They don't like the answer and they just want to argue about it. Well, there comes a point where you just need to fly from the misery. That can happen in, in all types of issues. Maybe it's not about Christian doctrine. Maybe it's just about interacting with somebody at work. Remembering God's grace toward you. God has been gracious toward you. So sometimes you need to walk away from something. Fly from the misery. Second, though, constant turmoil is not consistently avoidable with all people at all times. 
I said, firstly, be at peace with all men as best as possible. So constant turmoil is to be consistently avoidable. Yet, constant turmoil is not consistently avoidable with all people at all times. One writer, I think it was Haldane, that said this is one of the greatest afflictions of the Christian is to recognize and to, to live in this world and, and to come to this place to realize I'm just not going to be at peace with all people at all times. It becomes very hard sometimes to deal with some individuals. So what is the Christian action and response in times of turmoil with people? Well, it's a, it's a pretty important idea that, that Paul gets across here in the idea of blessing and grace. It's the idea of submit. My marker's not working too great this morning. You'll have to forgive me. I'll change it out here in hopes of finding another one. So it's the idea of submit. Submit. What are we submitting to? If, we, if we're going to, to try to live at peace with all men, what are we submitting to? Sometimes, firstly, we have to submit to this providence of God and this affliction of turmoil. Sometimes we have to recognize that not everything's going to go our way. We're not going to get our way all the time. Well, that's, that's a really hard thing. We, we, you know, we kind of chide toddlers and children and we laugh about it and, and we say to small children all the time, well, you're not getting your way. And as parents, there are times we do need to take stands with children. We have to do this. And we need to say, we're not going to get our way. It's just not going to happen. You don't get your way, little child. Well, sometimes in God's economy, in all of space and time and history, I have to recognize I'm not going to get my way either. I have to submit to this providence of God. That can be very difficult. But this is a way that we can be at peace with all men sometimes is to submit to this, not to submit to those people as though they are necessarily right. I may not know that. Um, I may think in my own mind they're wrong. But what I'm submitting to is to the providence of God. And God has ultimately given me this affliction. Well, that's hard. I want to kick against the goads. I, I, want, to, I want to kick against that and say, no, no, no. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, sometimes with some people, it just keeps going on and on. And I have to submit to God and His providence. And say, God, you've given me this affliction. I submit to you. David had to do this several times in his, his own life as king. He did it even in coming to deal with uh, being king and anointed king. Think of all that he had to deal with with Saul constantly. He had to submit to God's providence in these things. Think of Joseph submitting to the providences of his life, the afflictions that he had along the way. There was turmoil. And there were times he had to just submit to those things. Secondly, submit prayers for the individual before God. If I'm going to apply this, be at peace with all men as best as possible and recognize that it's not always going to happen, how can I submit to it in God's providence? Well, one of the ways I can do that is submit prayers for the individual, for that person, that persecutor, whoever it may be. Just as Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. Submit prayers for the individual. Pray God would save them if they're not converted. Maybe you and I don't know their souls, but we can say, Lord, I don't know their soul, but you do. If they're not one of your children, please save them. If they are one of your children, Lord, will you give them peace that they would be peaceable with other men, even including myself? Or maybe you say, Lord, I, I pray for them that... that whatever's going on in their life, they would learn peace that they wouldn't take this kind of turmoil home to their family. There's all types of ways to pray for these types of individuals, even to pray for ourselves. This is the third thought in submitting, submit to an evaluation of yourself before God. Robert Haldane says, when deprived of peace with men, we ought also to inquire whether there be not a cause of this in ourselves. 
maybe sometimes I'm partially bringing the affliction on myself. Maybe it's not just a personality quirk. Maybe it's just remaining flesh added on top of my personality or maybe it's not personality necessarily at all. It's just remaining flesh. Quiet people get angry too. Quiet people kick against this too. On the inside sometimes internally. Well, Maybe I need to submit to God before God and just evaluate, am I, am I part of this problem? Haldane goes on to say not only to find out whether or not we are a cause of this in ourselves, he says, For when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This says something very particular about dealing with our persecutors and dealing with the world. If we're going to be at peace with all men, is we have to recognize that our goal is not to please men, our goal is to please the Lord. If we are looking to please the Lord, the Lord will deal with us and He will help us not necessarily to deal with those people, because sometimes there may be no dealing with them from our perspective, but He will help us to trust Him that whatever may be going on, we would submit to Him. There's a big question here. Are you willing to submit to God's providence in your life? Even when it's difficult. Even when it's difficulty with people. That can be a tough question. Well, it leaves us with three observations from the text that really start to culminate this teaching all together. And it, it really starts here... Uh, where Paul says in verse 17, verse 18 was, uh, you know, be at peace with all men as far as it depends on you if possible. But back up to verse 17, it says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And then Paul says in verse 19, never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. Well, the first observation that we need to recognize, be vigilant in virulent deference to God's vengeance. We need to have a deference to God's vengeance here. And there needs to be a vigilant mindset that we would set this apart in a way in our minds to say, you know what? God is the one that, revenge, that vengeance, uh, brings vengeance upon others. God is the one that, that revenges uh, the, the, the troubles of His people. This has been the context that's been given throughout all of biblical history. God dealt with those who came against His people. Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Wow, that's difficult. Sometimes you, you, you stand your ground. But the Scripture teaches us never to pay back evil for evil to anyone. Now, we can get into all the what-ifs. Okay, and that, we're going to see that in Romans 13. Most of the time we come to texts like this and we start putting a whole bunch of questions onto the text without first just dealing with the flat, true teaching of the text itself. Before we get to the what-ifs, notice what Paul's saying. There ought to be a vigilant mindset for us, and we ought to be very, 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 very conscious of the vengeance of God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Never pay back evil. Never take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. Paul is picking this up from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 31 and 32. In verses 35 through 36 of Deuteronomy 32, Moses, Vengeance is mine and retribution. This is speaking of, of God speaking through Moses. In due time their foot will slip. 
for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate His people and will have compassion on His servants when He sees their strength is gone. I mean, this is the Lord's Word. This is what Paul is getting at. He's building upon these Old Covenant contexts or, or, or the Old Covenant content in a New Covenant context. And saying, we can pull this right in. This is a, this is a, a true stream of covenantal uh, continuity here. The New Covenant doesn't have a different teaching on this than the Old Covenant. Well, now that Christ has come, we can now be our own avengers. No. No. We need to, to be vigilant in giving deference to God's vengeance. Uh, I've often said to you all, uh, I think most of you have heard this probably, but remember that God's vengeance is much worse than anything you or I could do to anyone. Whatever the wrath of God is going to be like, it is going to be far greater than anything you, you or I could do in revenge or our own vengeance. And that needs to give us pause for a moment. However angry I am at someone, it's God who's going to bring about an ultimate vengeance as far worse. I, I need to take pause a moment and think to myself, whoa, wait a second. The vengeance of God is going to be on these people. I need to pray for them, pray for their souls. Do you? Is that what you really long for? Is for God to love you but bring vengeance on everybody else? Is this not the problem that Jonah had? He couldn't step back and understand the grace of God for a moment? King David even exhibited this mindset, uh, not the one of Jonah, but, but a mindset of, uh, of really understanding the, the vengeance of God on people in dealing with Shemi. In 2 Samuel 16, 5-7, When King David came to Baharim, behold, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemi, the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Shimei was just cursing one after another, throwing stones, calling out to David, Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow! Now this was after Absalom had gained the heart of the people that were told about in 2 Samuel chapter 15. David's son, and David is leaving uh, the city. And Shimei has come out, and he's just cursing David. And one of David's men, uh, Zerui, he says, Who is this man that he should do this? Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. But David said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zerui? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. Well, we know David's not perfect, but here the Scripture gives us an example of his understanding of God's vengeance being played out. And David said, you know what? I'm going to submit myself to this affliction, and maybe the Lord will look upon me and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. Now later, Shimei would come back and he would ask David forgiveness after uh, David had resumed the throne, so to speak. And Shammai would live under what he had done, the guilt of what he had done to King David, even to the point that later on, uh, Solomon, after David's death, 
uh, has to deal with Shammai and say, you're, you're put into the city of Jerusalem, you must stay there. And when Shammai didn't do it, he was put to death. The vengeance of the Lord was played out over time. The Lord Jesus even had to deal with this with His own disciples. They were arguing about who was the greatest. And they were arguing about those who were going out in the Master's name and casting demons. They came back and told Jesus of all these things and all that had happened. And James and John saw this and they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But the Lord Jesus rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. We often are quick to curse and not bless, to speak ill of and not well of, to not pray for, but to curse. We're often more quick to look at the vengeance we could play out. Here's James and John wanting to cast, call down fire upon these who are casting out demons in the name of the Master. Who are they? All of a sudden, James and John assume this authority that they know God's will in this? Was Zeruiah, was he to assume God's knowledge all of a sudden and he's the one in authority as he should be the one to take out Shammai? The problem, when we start to take vengeance upon our own hands, what we're saying is, is we have the authority to do so. No, God is the one that created life. He has the authority to bring vengeance upon life, not us. I didn't create anything. To curse someone else means that I'm taking authority upon myself that I don't have. Well, the second observation, be overcome with the goodness of God to overcome evil with good. Verse 20 says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. If I'm submitting to this under God's grace, then what I'm submitting to is understanding the very goodness of God and the grace of God. And in so doing, that helps me con think consistently about God's vengeance. If God is truly the only one who is good, and He is the only one who can show grace to sinners, then He has the right authority to bring about the proper justice and holiness upon any sinner. So it needs to be left to Him. So I have one job left to do. And that job is to be overcome with the goodness of God so that I overcome evil with good. And the example here is to give food and drink to your enemy. Can you hand your enemy a good thing? Versus cursing them. We've talked about the attitude of it. Now we're speaking about a physical context of it. Okay? There's an attitude. And in that attitude, how is it going to come out in our lives? Well, we give food and drink to our enemy. Paul uses language from... Proverbs 25, 21 through 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. It's going to be to our advantage to follow God's command here to allow vengeance to be from him and not from us. And for us to bless and not curse. To have an attitude of blessing, speaking well of, and to have a phys physical outworking of that blessing. Can I give a good thing to someone who's my persecutor? Or a good thing to someone who, for whatever reason, continues to be a griper and a complainer, or, or they're a problem, or they're this or that, the other? Can I do that? Scripture's telling me to. 
I need to think about the goodness of God to the point that it overcomes evil with good in my own life. Think about how good God is to us as sinners and I ought to be able to reflect that in my life toward others by the power of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Lastly, this morning, recognize evil is not your friend, so make it your enemy. Evil is not your friend, so make it your enemy. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When we're overcoming evil, we don't overcome it with evil. We overcome evil with good. And that good heaps burning coals on someone's head. If people see and recognize that all we bring is peace to the table, and we're not contributing to the problems all the time, and a person keeps coming at us, and yet all we do is we, we bring about uh, good things to them, and they keep persecuting us. Eventually, verse 17, respect what is right in the sight of all men. Other men will start to recognize, because the law of God is written on their heart, that, you know what? This person's a jerk. And we're going to heap burning coals on their head to the point that after a while, other people are going to recognize, you know what? It's one thing to just kind of go after somebody a little while because you want to be right, but this person just keeps on and on and on, and all this Christian does is keep giving good. It just heaps burning coals on their head. Now, it might make them more angry, but the angrier they get at it, the more foolish they're going to look in the eyes of men around them. God's Word here helps us in such great measure. We need to recognize that Evil is not our friend. It may be the friend of, of the unconverted, but it's not the friend of the Christian. We need to make evil our enemy. And we make evil our enemy by not putting evil back out, vengeance back out. We need to make evil our enemy by overcoming it with good. A benevolent attitude of blessing, speaking well of and giving good things even to those who persecute us. These are difficult teachings. Let us take some time this morning and think about them. Read through these scriptures. Don't just come with all your questions about what if, when can I do this? When can I punch them in the face? We're not talking here about defending your home from an intruder who's got your family at gunpoint. That's not what we're speaking of here. That's not the what if here. We're talking about working this out in daily life in another context than the immediate self-defense of protecting the lives of your loved ones. That's something different. We can have that discussion in another place. Look at this text for what it is. First deal with it for what it is, then begin to ask those questions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful to give us this time in your word. May we be thoughtful about these things according to the truth of your word. And Lord, will you please help the Spirit of God to deal with our souls that these truths would be illumined and that our thoughts and our minds would be renewed in transformation of your word, just as Paul had told us earlier in Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we need, Lord. We give all glory and honor unto you through your Son, the Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I hope you enjoy this Bible study, and may you have a good day in the Lord.